and we start out back in history where we didn't know a whole lot. We knew that there were some special solutions, but we didn't know what was going on that made them special, but we could categorize. So that was one of the earliest things that scientists started doing was categorizing things. It's like when you're a little baby. Once you start growing up and start doing things, you start categorizing. You put the square blocks in the square holes and you put the little blue things together. You, that's one of the earliest things that you start doing as you're learning things as a little kid. And that's kind of how science started out too. So they said we have these two categories of things that a lot of stuff falls into. Not everything. Not everything is an acid or a base. We also have neutral. But a lot of things fall into one of these two categories. Acids are things that are sour, which we know a lot of the time we don't want to taste things in chemistry. We don't want to take the hydrochloric acid that we're using in the lab tomorrow, the six molar, six concentration of HCl. We don't want to put that in our mouth to taste that it's sour. If we did, it would taste sour, and then it would start eating away at our mouth, and that would be bad. Um, oops, sorry. You don't eat it, eat it too. Yeah, exactly. You don't eat it, eat it too. Very nice. Um, we know that the pH of acids are less than 7. And we're going to talk more about the pH scale in the third set of notes and how we got that pH scale. Some examples that fall under this category, orange juice, lemons, vinegar, soda pop, stomach acid, and some of the acids that are in these, so it's helpful to know what these different ones are. So orange juice and lemons, those are going to be citric acids. Let's see if this will actually work for us. Nope, go back. There we go. So we've got <coughs> citric acid for these. Vinegar is going to be acetic acid. This one has a really important special name, though, that you're going to want to memorize besides acetic acid. That's ethanoic acid. E-T-H-A-N-O-I-C. Ethanoic acid. We're going to learn where that name comes from when we get into organic chemistry and naming, which we'll finish off the year with. We'll get into just the barely beginning naming of uh, organic molecules. Ethan means that we have two carbons in a line, and then the oic acid means that we have an OOH. What's, what's going on? What? You said ethan. Yep. Eth yeah, ethan. Yeah. Yeah. Ethan, oic, um, means that they're single bonds. That's the an part of it. And then eth is two carbons. So we're going to get there. This means that I have an OOH. So we're going to get into that. Uh, it comes from acetate. So what's the symbol for acetate? C2H3O2. Good. And what was the charge on it? One minus. Very good. So whenever I have an ion, it's got to join with something else. And the thing, if it's an acid, it's bonding with is a hydrogen. What's the charge of a hydrogen ion? One plus. Very good. So I have H C two H three O two is one way to write it. They also sometimes write it with H C two H H two O O H. So sometimes they're going to write it a little bit different. This is showing us more of the order that it's going to be bonded in, which we'll get more into in organic chemistry. Just count how many you have. If you have this total, it's talking about ethanoic acid know that. Memorize it. Do a big star next to it. Memorize that. It's going to come up. Carbon's got carbonic acid. That's one of them. It also has some things like phosphoric acid. Um, but the main one is carbonic. Well, let's write it out this way. You'll see carbonic acid later, so I won't write out the symbol. And what do you guys know is the main component of stomach acid? Anybody know? Eh, some people know. People know interesting things. It always surprises me. It's hydrochloric. Hmm. 
hydrochloride is our stomach acid. The bases are bitter, they're slippery. Soap is a base. That's where that slippery part comes from. The pH is greater than 7. Lots of cleaners, ammonia, baking soda, and soaps are bases. So that was early history. We're categorizing. We don't know anything about the chemistry that's going on, but we're categorizing into these two classes of stuff. Either it falls under one of these or it's none of those. But then comes around this guy named Arrhenius. I don't know why it's saying add or modify. That's okay. Arrhenius said that an acid is anything that contains a hydrogen and ionizes in water to release a proton. I've got a little question here. H plus is a proton, and I want to think about why it is. So we're going to go back a little bit into our history in this class, and we're going to write down the nuclear symbol. For the hydrogen atom. Huh. Nuclear symbol for the hydrogen atom. Try it on your paper. Try to remember what the nuclear symbol is. A little hint, it was that AZX. We're going just the symbol for the atom first. We'll do the ion next. First of all, what's the symbol for hydrogen? H. Oh, yeah. Yep, so I start with that. That's my X, so I have A, Z, X. What would my A be? My number that goes up top. One. Yep, it's always going to be the mass number. The mass number is made of what two subatomic particles? Protons and neutrons. Very good. So that's protons plus neutrons. Oh, look at us reviewing for the final already. Okay, so I've got my mass number up there, protons plus neutrons. What goes on the bottom? The atomic number. Yep, atomic number, which for hydrogen, what is it? One. Oops, just one. Atomic number is one. Atomic number, and that's my number of protons. And then I said this was the atom, so there's no charge up here. I don't have to write anything, or I could write a zero, showing that there's no charge. So that's uh, my atom. Now let's think about another way of representing this. I could draw it out. So I have my nucleus here. I'll do an NUC for nucleus. What is in my nucleus for hydrogen? I've got a proton. How many protons? One, how many neutrons? Zero. Zero, because it's one minus one. I have one proton. My new mass is protons plus neutrons. One minus one. I have zero, so I just have a proton there. And then I've got my energy levels where my electrons go. How many electrons does an atom of hydrogen have? One. So my energy level, E level, has just one electron in it. So I've got a proton and an electron. Now, when I form the ion, what am I losing? I'm losing an electron. So that goes away. I'm left with just a proton in the nucleus. That's why we call H plus a proton. That's all that's left. When the hydrogen ion becomes, or when the hydrogen atom becomes an ion, it's just left over as a proton. So let's write our new nuclear symbol for it. I've got my H there. What's the mass of it? It's still 1, yeah, because I still have that proton in there, so it's still a 1. What's the atomic number of it? 1. What if it was something different? What would happen if my atomic number was different? Yeah, I'd have different protons, which would be a different atom. Yep, so I'd have to have a whole different thing here besides hydrogen if that number changed. Good. And then what's my charge now? One plus, because all that I'm left with is a proton. So my charge is a one plus.
What questions do you have before we move on? Go ahead, Owen. When was that hydrogen, uh, whatever you call it, ionized electron? When was that like? Ionized? When would I lose that electron? Yeah. Uh, really easily whenever there's some place for that electron to go. And so we'll see, we'll see more in Chapter 9 where exactly the electron's going, but we can kind of imagine it here when we get a little bit further through the notes today. Good question. What other questions do you guys have? So, he said that about acids, he also said, oh, no, we'll look at some examples of acids first. So, hydrochloric acid, you're going to want to start to memorize some of these, but they're easy to figure out. So, the hydro comes from the hydrogen part of it, because acids contain a hydrogen ion. And we said that hydrogen ions are a 1 plus, so I have an H1 plus. And then the chloric is coming just from the chlorine ion. So, what charge is a chlorine ion? One negative, very good. So hydrochloric acid is just HCl. So he would represent this. He'd say, I have HCl dissolved in water, so it's aqueous, and it's going to dissociate into an H1 plus as well as a Cl1 negative. Since this has one hydrogen, it's called monoprotic. One hydrogen means it's monoprotic. <laughs> Sulfuric acid. Ooh. So it doesn't have the hydro part of it, but it does have an acid, so I know that there's going to be an H1 plus in making it. Sulfuric comes from the sulfate ion. So we have to think back to over last summer what the sulfate ion is. What is the sulfate ion? Go ahead, Anna. Yeah, I get H2SO4 because SO4 is a 2 negative. So I get H2SO4. Very nice. Aqueous dissolves into H1 plus plus SO4, 2 negative. Is that balanced? No. How do I get that one balanced? Yeah, two in front of the H. Beautiful. So this would be called diprotic. It has two hydrogens that it could get rid of. Phosphoric acid is the next one. I want you to try to figure that one out on your own. PO4 is phosphate. What's the charge of PO4? Three negative. Very nice. Most of you are remembering to crisscross those charges. H is a 1 plus, PO4 is a 3 negative. One thing I was just thinking of might be a good question for you guys. Why is it not diatomic? We always write H as a 2 plus. Why are we not doing that here? It's because we're looking at the ions. So we're looking at how it dissociates. It's not forming new hydrogen gas or anything like that. So we wouldn't do an H2 here. 
if we had an actual reaction reaction, we weren't just dissociating things in solution, we would have to write out the H2. So you might want to make a note to yourself just so you remember that we don't do it as a diatomic molecule here. Okay, and I saw most of you had it. Um, we had phosphoric acid as H3PO4. Oops. Aqueous. So it's going to dissolve into H1 plus and PO4 three negative. And most of you got it balanced correct. Show me with your hands what goes in front of the hydrogen there. Awesome. Those of you that are showing me, that's perfect. Three goes in front of the H1 plus. I have a balanced reaction. This would be three of them, so try protic. So triprotic acid it has three hydrogens that it could get rid of. Now it's not always going to dissociate completely. We're going to see that as we go on. Correct. Yep. Okay. Arrhenius then said, if that's what we know about acids, then bases are something that contain OH. And they are going to ionize in water to release an OH. So an example for us here is potassium hydroxide. Looking at your periodic table, show me with your hands, what is the charge of potassium? It's awesome. Yeah, it's a one positive. And then show me with your hands. Actually, you don't have to because it shows us right here. It's an OH1 negative. Oops, one H1 negative. There we go. So we have KOH aqueous. Going to dissolve into a K1 plus and an OH1 negative. And that one's already balanced. We don't have monobasic, dibasic, tribasic. We don't think of it that way, or at least IB doesn't require that you think of it that way. But if you look back to your initial chart, so flip back to the first page and look at the bases part, is there a base listed on there that does not follow this rule of containing an OH and associating to release OH1 negative? You might have to think about it for a second. Um, I think that actually does have an OH on it. Yeah. Ammonia. Ammonia, very nice, Richie. Ammonia does not have an OH. It is ammonia, and it is NH3. So ammonia is an NH3. Thank you. Ammonia is basic and doesn't fit the definition. So we had our initial, let's just categorize things. Then we had a scientist that's actually like, okay, I want to think about what's going on here on the atomic level. And that was Arrhenius. He started us off down that scientific path. But his categorization didn't quite fit for us. So we have to come up with a new definition. And Bronsted and Lowry, two different guys, came up with a new definition. They didn't actually work together, but they came up with the idea at the same time, so they're both credited with it. And they said that an acid is a proton donor, so an H1 plus donor, proton donor. That was their definition of it. And they said bases on the flip side are proton acceptors. So they're thinking that whatever we're doing has to have an acid and a base, something that's acting in both ways. If one of them is giving up a proton, then something else must be there to take a proton from it. It's not just floating off in space. And so they just take the definition or the way that we write things a little bit differently. So ammonia, we said, is an NH3. And rather than just writing the aqueous, we're actually going to write in the water. We know that it's dissociating in water, so let's actually write down that water. So we're going to write plus H2O. And then we can see where these protons are moving to. So if the ammonia is a base, we said that on the last slide, ammonia is a base. We said it on the first slide too. Ammonia is a base. That means that it is going to accept a proton. It needs to get a proton from somewhere else. 
Where is it getting that proton from? H2O, absolutely, Danny. Thank you. So it is going to get one from here. And so my water is acting as an acid. Water is acting as an acid. This is actually an equilibrium reaction. Depending on how much it dissociates, we could write the arrows differently, but it is an equilibrium reaction. And my products would be NH4, now with a 1 plus, because it has one more proton than it did before. And here's where that OH came in. OH, one negative. So Arrhenius was kind of on the right track. He knew that OH had to be associated with this somehow. He just didn't quite get the definition of it right. But would that still It is still dissociation. We just write it more in a way that shows what's actually happening on the atomic level. But it's still just dissociation. A yeah. yeah, little bit more so, but still not completely. Because we're not really forming anything new. It's just breaking into the ions. So let's look at it, or let's look at a definition, two definitions actually. Conjugate acid is formed by a base accepting a proton, and a conjugate base is formed by an acid donating a proton. I'm going to write, let's see here. I'm going to write this down again so we can see it. H3 plus H2O is an equilibrium for NH4. 1 plus plus OH, 1 negative. Base. And these two definitions right here, along with this definition right here, gives us that 8.1 understanding 1 and 3. If you want to double check me, you can do that on your standard sheet. So thinking about what's going on here, what do these two things actually mean? We're looking at the product side. So these always are dealing with the product side. And we're just looking at how this equilibrium is going to go back in the reverse reaction. So to get back to the way they were, the ammonium ion, to get back to ammonia, would have to donate one of its protons to the hydroxide ion, which would take it and become water. So is the ammonium ion acting as an acid or a base? Acid. But it's on the product side, so it's the conjugate acid. Oops. I'm going to add an extra A in there. Conjugate acid. So my base and my conjugate acid are always related. The conjugate acid is formed from the base. And that means that my OH that's accepting an H plus is my conjugate base. And that's why it's associated with my acid. Is that only going to happen in the equilibrium? It will, yep. Yep, and all of these will be behaving in equilibrium. So in solution, if I put an acid or a base in, there's always going to be this equilibrium happening. Good question. What other questions before we move on? You guys are going to give some of these a try then. So, first of all, we've got carbonic acid and hydrogen sulfate ion. The hydrogen sulfate ion already tells you what the, the charge and everything is. Um, this one, my tip to you, it could go either way. So it could be both behaving as an acid or a base, both of them. So you're going to have to write two equations out for this one. So make a little note to yourself, two equations. The carbonic acid, I want to give you the start off for that one. So the acid part of it means that it's got an H1 plus. And then the carbonic comes from the carbonate ion. So what is the carbonate ion? CO3 two. Nice, CO3 two negative. Okay, work with the, your elbow partners, so the people that are right next to you. Bless you, and I am going to be walking around seeing how you are doing.
you don't have an elbow partner, find somebody else nearby. Oh wait, no, no, no. It'd just be us up there. So it is. I think I like pass in the donator protocol. Oh, yeah. So, so, so we want the acid with the base on. So So what's up? It comes out of the and then what it happens. Is this base equation They're starting though, not hydrogen, not it's not sulfuric acid, it's a hydrogen sulfur only until eight plus one four one year. So start one for for reactive. Yeah. 
So the H3O, what charge would it have? Yeah. I know what it is. I love that. I think it was an anchor that tried to write like Troy. And for, for a very long period, I couldn't even read what I was writing. Oh, no. <laughs> so take a look at uh, the first one, H2CO3 plus H2O. 
we see, we know that that's an acid. And based off of our definition, acids are proton donors. And that's how we get what we have over here. It gave up one of those to one negative, to one positive, and to get back, that gets one up, which is why that's the conjugate acid, and that's the conjugate base. Very nice. Awesome. I know, right? Kirby. Ah, excellent question. We'll get to that hopefully before class is over. Is that a total So we have a base here, which means it's going to accept a proton, which is why the water is an acid in this one. It's giving it up, which is why that's now H2SO4, sulfuric acid. That, to get back the way it was, has to go over there. Please excuse the interruption. This announcement is for all juniors. Please go to the cafeteria at the end of first hour to complete your ACT interest inventory. So all juniors go to the cafeteria at the end of first hour to complete your ACT interest inventory. Thank you. Okay. Here's my other reaction that could happen with that one. We have H2 or HSO4 with negative as an acid giving up a proton to the base. I get SO4 2 negative and H3 O1 positive being my conjugate acid. So those are my two possible reactions for that one. And that's just because if it's got a negative, it could take another proton. And if it's got a proton, it could give that up. So that's why it could go either way with that one. Okay. Let's get to Kirby's question. So, first of all, we even have a newer definition of acids and bases. And our guidance actually tells us that we don't need to know a lot of this. But it's no good, I, that's one of the changes that I don't like about IB because it's important to understand that our definition isn't that basic anymore. We know more about it and we can incorporate more elements and compounds. So an acid is a species that accepts a pair of electrons to form a dative bond. And we saw that when we were doing Lewis structures before. Dative bond means that the electrons that are being shared between a spe two species is shared from one of them. So if I have a covalent bond, they're sharing two electrons. Both of those two electrons came from one atom, not the other one. A base, he said, is a species that donates the electron pair to form a bond. Again, this allows our idea of acids and bases to extend more to the more than just compounds that contain a hydrogen. Because Bronze and Lowry were, were stuck with things that have hydrogen in them. But there's other things that act as acids and bases, like boron trifluoride acts as an acid. How does that happen? It's because Lewis said, let's not look at protons, but let's look at the electrons and the sharing of the electrons. There should be a dative bond involved. In the, in the base? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, now we're to Kirby's question. So amphiprotic and amphoteric. Both, there's, there are things that can be both acids and bases. Like water. Or the HSO4 one negative when they can act as both a pro or an acid and a base. That's when we have either an amphoteric or an amphiprotic. Amphiprotic, though, specifically is talking about there being a hydrogen involved. So the water and the HSO4 one negative. Amphoteric, though, 
gets us to our Lewis definition. So looking more at electrons, there doesn't have to be a hydrogen there. Some examples of our amphiprotic water, hydrogen sulfate ion, we saw both of those. And a lot of the metal hydroxides act the same way. Here we have an example of water and water. Water and water in solution, we know it's neutral generally overall, but we had this acid-base reaction going on within atoms. It's just not substantial enough for us to tell them, bless you. Um, so one of the waters gives up a proton to the other one. One of them is acting as an acid, the other one as a base. And that's where I get OH1 negatives and H301 positives. Go ahead, Eric. Because they've got space for both. Water can it either has a spot where we can put another hydrogen in it, or we can give up that hydrogen. Or anything that's amphiprotic. Yeah. And that's like the HSO4 that we saw over there that Troy wrote the first one for us. HSO41 negative can accept another proton, or it has one more proton that it could get rid of.